Sandy, ¿te ayudo admitiendo al, a los alumnos? Sí, por favor. Sí, te ayudo, vale. Listo. Okay. Well, good morning, um, everyone, and good afternoon in the UK. We are on the third session of this binational seminary. And today we will have two speakers, Dr. Wang and Dr. Paredes, that I will introduce in a second. I'm getting my information. So Dr. Chu Wang is a senior lecturer in biomedical science at Manchester Metropolitan University. She obtained her PhD in molecular and cellular biology on studying PAX3 gene. And her main research areas are cancer research and stem cell research, which include identifying therapeutic potential of natural products and pharma pharmacological compounds with anti-cancer activities. Stem cell research focuses on using embryonic stem cells to explore neural crest development. Dr. Wang is a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Science in the UK and an editorial board member of the British Journal of Biomedical Science. And I wanted to mention one of the books she has co-authored, which could be of interesting to many of our students, which is titled Biomedical Science Practice, Experimental and Professional Skills. And it's on its second edition. So welcome Dr. Wang. And I guess I will uh, let Dr. Wang give her lecture and then I will introduce Dr. Paredes as soon as she finishes, if that's okay. Like that. Yeah, just load my slides. Uh, if I'm right, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, I'm Dr. Chiu Yuan. Thank you very much for the organizers, including um, Magda Arida, uh, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. My ongoing research projects include studying the molecular and cellular basis of cancer and um, uh, stem cells. So we have been investigating gene expression profiles of specific types of cancer, exploring cell signaling pathways of cancer cells. For example, study AGE and RAGE signaling pathway and identifying potential cancer biomarkers, as well as identifying therapeutic potential of natural products and the pharmacological compounds with anti-cancer activities. My stem cell research focuses on using embryonic stem cells to explore uh, neural crest development and differentiation. This talk will focus on the latter. So my PhD studied uh, PAX3 gene. PAX3 gene is a developmental gene, belongs to PAX3 gene family. It's, it is highly conserved in different species. Human PAX3 is located on chromosome 2Q35. The protein contains, uh, consists of paired domain, uh, homeo domain, and uh, transactivation domain. The paired domain and the homeo domain collaboratively interact with each other for selection of target genes. Uh, octa, uh, octapeptide motif and the transactivation domain involved in protein-protein interactions, so they can recruit other transcription factor. Uh, PAX3 plays an uh, essential role during early embryonic development. It involves in myogenesis, melanogenesis, and neurogenesis all of which 
it requires the migration of cells from neural crest uh, or the dorsal uh, dermal myotome. Hex3 uh, expression is uh, transient uh, tri 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 uh, during embryonic development. Abnormal re expression of Hex3 has been found in tumors, including rhabdomyosarcoma, melanoma, and neuroblastoma. Heterozygous mutations, uh, mutations of PAC3 in human can cause Wadenberg syndrome 1 and uh, uh, syndrome of uh, three, PAC3. PAC3 mutations in uh, mice can cause uh, splotch mice. And one characteristic of Wadenberg syndrome and the splotch mice is pigmentary uh, abnormalities. Hormone zygous uh, mutations are lethal. So about 35% of human genes show various spliced products. When we screen the PAX3 expression in human cutaneous and uh, ocular melanoma, and human neuroblastoma tissues and cell lines, we identified the two new um, PAC3 isoforms. They are PAC3G and H. If you look at their structure, G and H, they are truncated form of PAC3D uh, and E respectively. Their axon 8 is missing. So we noticed that these isoforms exhibited different transcriptional uh, specificities. For example, C and D are predominantly expressed in melanoma uh, tumors and cell lines, while PAC3G and H are major forms seen in neuroblastoma. So we demonstrated that PAX3 could transform mouse melanocytes, melan A, um, and this transformed the melanocytes gained melanoma characteristics. We then investigated the roles of PAX3 isoforms in mouse embryonic stem cells in vitro, with aims to illustrate uh, mechanisms of PAX3 in development and we want to compare their roles with uh, 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 with their sorry compare uh, with their roles in tumor genesis. Stem cells possess two major uh, properties. They are capable of self renewal and uh, are pluripotent. As mentioned earlier, that uh, PAX3 involved in uh, my, uh, melanocyte and um, pigment cell, and uh, also involved in, uh, involved in neurons and uh, uh, muscle cell development. So we, exam uh, we examine the uh, PAX3 isoform expression in parental uh, E14 cells before transfection. And uh, uh, PAX3 e, uh, C, E, and G isoform uh, genes were not detectable in E14. Although you may notice that uh, here, huh, there's uh, uh, a band show here, and we don't know what it is. Uh, certainly, it is not, uh, it's not PAX3 G uh, because of its different size. We might uh, yeah, sequence it in the future. Uh, we do see some expression of PAX3H in E14 cells. So to construct a stable cell line express, uh, expressing different PAX3 isoforms in E14, we use the plasmid DNA, uh, PCDNA4, uh, which carries PAX3 isoform genes. The plasmid also uh, contains uh, express uh, uh, IP tope and also contain anti xylosin uh, gene. So the expression uh, 
of PAX3 S4 genes were uh, verified by RT-PCR and uh, E14 transfected, uh, transfected uh, uh, with the PCDNA4 optic vector was used as control clones. As expressed epitope in the plasmid was conjugated with PAX3, so we use the FITC labeled expressed antibody uh, to further confirm the successful transfection. Uh, after transfection, we found that uh, three PAX3 isoforms have no discern uh, uh, discernible effect on the morphology of E14 cell-derived uh, embryoid bodies. Alkaline phosphatase is, is one of the key markers of pluripotent uh, embryonic stem cells. The expression of PAX3C and PAX3G reduced the AP uh, activities, while PAX3E uh, increased its activity. Uh, further, we did some uh, proliferation assay. We observed PAX3CE and G as forms show different effects on E14 cell proliferation in vitro. And the PAX3C, for example, PAX3C transfectins uh, grow significantly faster than empty vector control transfectins, while PAX3 genome uh, proliferatedly significantly slower than the vector control. Cell cycle also showed uh, E14 uh, PAX3 transfectins uh, uh, has different. Uh, uh, Proportion in in cell cycle stages. Some migration I say demonstrate that PAX three C and PAX three G transfectins migrated faster than vector control, while PAX three uh, E transfectins uh, was similar to uh, control cells in cell migration. We analyze. Uh, uh, the changes of global gene expression in E14 cells in response to PAX3C, E, and G as forms using IFI matrix microarrays. The principal component analysis uh, shows uh, the PC, PC1 and the PC2. The uh, vari total variation is 31.8% uh, and uh, and 29.9%. Uh, so by micro, uh, microarray analysis, we identified a total of 964 genes were up or down regulated over twofold in PAX3 isoform transfectins uh, in comparison with control cells. Uh, one diagram shows the overlapping of genes different, differentially expressed in three isoform transfectins. But PAX3E, you may notice, has fewer regulatory uh, effects on gene expression trans of transcription than PAX3C and D, uh, C and G. So. Then we also noticed there's a total of 19 genes related to uh, neurogenesis. Uh, their expression were changed. So that's uh, highlighted in red color in this table. Using the gene ontology and the CAG database combined with our microarray data, we noticed that uh, the changes uh, of gene expression related to notch signaling pathway. And uh, this table also summarizes uh, the notch signaling uh, pathway genes whose expression changed. So we further confirmed uh, these changes, uh, 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 gene changes, include Notch 3 and JAG1, DL1, uh, using RT PCR and uh, Western blotting. Uh, we also did uh, only, only did Notch 3 uh, in uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, 
to test the differences of uh, isoform expression uh, in these transfectants. Uh, sorry, the uh, notch three different notch three expression in pack three transfectants. Um, the uh, DAP, uh, DAPT is, um, uh, is an inhibitor of notch. So treatment with one microliter DAPT, we found uh, um, there's no differences of their uh, proliferation uh, within 24 hours. If you look at this uh, uh, trends compared with earlier proliferation trends, uh, there's changes. But after 48 and 72 hours, the trends no difference. So we propose that block of notch cycling can slow down E14 uh, control and uh, PAX3CE transfectants, uh, but didn't hold or stop their proliferation. So our study highlights how the expression of PAX3 as a form directly regulates the notch signaling pathway and may interfere with other transcriptional net, uh, networks regulate uh, stem cell differentiation, proliferation, uh, migration. So a brief summary about uh, uh, our uh, this study, PAX3 isoforms differentially regulate expression of genes involved in the notch signaling pathway in embryonic stem cells. And uh, these isoforms show different effects on uh, E14 proliferation and migration. So these isoforms may, three isoforms, may exert their biological effects in embryonic stem cells, at least partially through regulating uh, notch pathway. Another project we have carried out is induction of embryonic stem cells differentiation into neural crest cell uh, derivatives. Many factors uh, uh, can influence stem cell differentiation, such as the transcription factors, including PEX3. And we are particularly interested in neural crest cell lineages. Neural crest cell are a transient population of multi-picant stem cells. They form at the border of a neural plate during gastrulation. The neural crest formation in humans began three to five works after conception. They can differentiate into different cell types. The differentiation is influenced by signals from ectoderm and underlying mesoderm. So here just to show some cell lineages derived, derived from uh, neural crest, for example, pigment cells, melanocytes, Schwann cells, um, and also include uh, smooth muscle cells. Neural crest differentiation is tightly uh, controlled. Defects in human neural crest development are the cause of neural uh, crystal pathways. The most common clinical phenotypes include craniofacial abnormalities, hearing loss, or abnormal pigmentation. Um, example of NCPs include Puss Jag syndrome, PGS, and also include. Uh, Hirsch-Brown's Hirsch, uh, Hirsch uh, disease, HD. We develop a method uh, to induce differentiation of embryonic stem cells into neural crest lineage, peripheral neurons. So the left, the left figure shows the workflow of this method. And uh, the right figure shows the morphological variation of cells at different uh, stages of differentiation. This is day zero, and day three, day seven, day 10, 17, 20, 24, during this uh, peripheral neural uh, differentiation. Uh, on our secondary induction medium, um, 
uh, sorry, in this medium contains the uh, BMP4. So we check the eff effects of BMP4 on neural crest marker expression uh, during stage two uh, induction. Uh, we see that BMP4 induced the PAX3 expression after 10 days of differentiation, but uh, inhibited uh, Nestin Sox9 and uh, Musashi1 expression. And you can also see the changes of PAX3 expression during the differentiation of uh, E14 into peripheral neurons over 40 eight days. So you can see the trend uh, when the uh, reach the neural crest stage and uh, the PAX3 uh, expression increased and the further uh, later differentiation, uh, the expression of PAX3 reduced and decreased. Expression of neural crest and the somatic cell type markers were tested by fluorescent uh, immunocytochemistry. So you can see at early stage, uh, the neural crest marker SOX10 and P75 uh, expression. Later, uh, in different differentiation medium, you can see preferring expression. And in smooth muscle uh, cell medium, after differentiation, you can see uh, smooth muscle acting uh, differentiation. And the OCT4 uh, uh, expression we tested uh, during stage two uh, using flow cytometry. The expression of peripheral, uh, the markers of peripheral neurons like uh, uh, a uh, peripheral and uh, the marker of uh, neurons, new, Neural vaccine three were tested with without uh, BMP4. Yeah, so oh, you can see the a difference. Um, a preference expression was also measured by flow cytometry. The differentiated cells was uh, were able to adhere and grow on MEEA chips. So you can see uh, cells form the connections between. Uh, electrode in single or multi, uh, multiple cell three layers. Um, these uh, cells actually also can respond to neuron transmitter, NMDA and GABA uh, uh, treatment simulation. So a brief summary of uh, the, uh, this study. Um, we can generate functional peripheral neurons from mouse embryonic stem cells follow neural crest lineage induction and differentiation. BMP4 can change the expression of several uh, uh, plural potency and neural crest specified gene, include OCT4. BMP4 exposure is required for the generation of um, uh, peripheral neurons, and we also identify the uh, potential feedback loop with the neural crest marker uh, PAX3. So finally, yeah, last but not least, I want to thank you. Uh, these people uh, help with uh, various aspects of the project, particularly Professor Patricia Kuma. She was my supervisor of my PhD and postdoc. And the differentiation of stem cell work into peripheral neuron were, were done by uh, our PhD student, Stewart Fielding and later carried on and uh, confirmed some study by an uh, MSc student, uh, Sally. Uh, some colleagues uh, co-supervised uh, this PhD project. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Wang. Yes, we do have um, a first question. One from Dr. Paredes is, is there a time window for the effects of PAX3 isoforms? Um, uh, yeah, I presume so. Uh, in, uh, we didn't check isoform e e expression in this uh, uh, stem cell differentiation in peripheral neurons, which are total general mouse. Actually, we checked mm -hmm. the mouse. Different uh, uh, 
uh, cell models. So the second model, second study, we use uh, embry uh, mouse embryonic stem cells. So we checked uh, uh, mouse uh, uh, PAX3. So we can see the yeah, the changes of the expression with the different so the stages, days of, yeah. So there are changes. I, yeah. I, I had a, a question myself. Um, knowing that, um, you know, PAX3 is involved in the, um, you know, development of these cells and their phenotype, um, and also its, its relationship, it's also related to uh, neural crest cells. And, and the role of these neural crest cells in neuroblastoma, is there mm -hmm. any way to connect, um, you know, either to find diagnostic tests for children that are usually uh, di diagnosed too late, you know, mm -hmm. when they have neuroblastoma? Is there, do you think there will be a possibility of using some of these markers to to diagnose these these children uh, mm. early, early. Yeah. Um, the uh, mutations of PAC three using in the diagnosis of uh, neuroblastoma hasn't been used clinically, <laughs> and only in research. But uh, the uh, the the. Uh, testing of PAX3 mutations in the diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma has been mm. applied clinically, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And because, uh, yeah, because PAX3, I think the expression during embryogenesis, but mainly in earlier stage of embryogenesis, so later stage and uh, their expression switch off. Mm. But uh, interestingly, this uh, neural crest, uh, cells, original tumor, like mel melanoma, like uh, blastoma, like rhabdomyosarcoma. So the expression of PAX3 re-expressed. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that means these cells actually de-differentiate, I presume they de-differentiated and later but like, uh, you know, cancer yeah. cells always share the characters mm -hmm. like yeah. some cells. Yeah. yeah, they're not differentiated. So one, one, pos well, yeah, mm -hmm. one possibility is have mm. them differentiate or push them to, to differentiate, I guess, you know, at least theoretically, one could think about that. Mm. Any more questions? Miss, if I find any other questions, I have to open the participant list and see if we have, we have no more raised hands and I don't have anything else in the chat. Do we have anything else, uh, Sandy? No? No. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for thank your you. talk. And uh, we're going to go ahead and um, start with the lecture from Dr. Raul Paredes. I will introduce him to all of you. He um, studied um, psychology at the Universidad de Nahuac, and he got his master's and doctoral degree in biomedical sciences by uh, the National University of Mexico both with um, uh, honorific mention. And he did his postdoc at the Department of Biology of the University of Boston. And um, his first, his main line of research involves brain plasticity and the neurobiology of motivated behaviors. And he specializes in neural control, um, uh, pleasant behaviors and the neurogenesis related to, be, to sexual behavior. And he has uh, participated in numerous uh, research uh, projects. He's currently the director of the uh, Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores, and he was the former director of the Instituto de Neurobiología. So good morning, Dr. Dr. Pader Paredes. You can start. I think he's probably muted. Muted now. Okay. Can you? Can yes. You? yes. I, was, I was muted. Sorry about that. It wasn't all my fault. Well, thanks. Thanks for your presentation, Dr. Giordano. I'm going to talk about what, we, what we've been doing in the last maybe three years that we started this new line of research trying to uh, use uh, sophisticated 
or at least a new toy that we have at the, here at the campus, which is the magnetic resonance imaging for small rodents. And um, since it's a very expensive equipment, we decided to try to use it the best way we can, basically. So uh, that's what we've been doing for the last two or three years, try to identify brain circuits controlling motivated behaviors by magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging. So what are motivated behaviors? Doctor well, Paredes, uh, ¿nos podría poner la pantalla completa, perdón? Uh, ¿No está completa? Señor. There you go. Okay. So motivated behaviors are activated mechanisms that direct and include behaviors to an incentive. They are important for the survival of the species, not necessarily for the individual. For example, a motivated behavior is sexual behavior, that it's important for the survival of the species. But there are some animals that will not mate, although they are repeatedly tested with receptive females, for example. These non-copulating males can go all their life without mating, and nothing's going to happen to the animal. Of course, it's in the endangered in dangers of the species. They don't reproduce. Another characteristic of the of motivated behavior is that uh, they induce physiological and anatomical brain changes. As we're going to mention in the in a few moments, they can induce uh, the also plastic permanent brain changes. And we basically have been studying two motivated behaviors, one for a longer time, which is sexual behavior. And the other motivated behavior that we started using recently because we thought it was very interesting is the use of the running wheel. That it's also something that happens in laboratory conditions. A lot of people say that they, the animals start using the running wheel because since they're born in the lab conditions, they don't have anything else to do. So they might as well run. But there are some studies in naturalistic settings in which animals will also use the running wheel. So this is some motivated behavior, not necessarily associated with the lack of activity to do in a laboratory setting. One of the main characteristics of, of sexual behavior is that you can use or you can analyze it in different conditions. Here you can see, I hope the video runs well. There are two main characteristics of different settings and you can observe sexual behavior. One is what we call pace mating, which is the ability of females to control the rate of sexual stimulation. This happened in, in natural environments, but also you can you do it in a laboratory conditions, but having here a, an observation cage and you have here in the middle a barrier with a hole in the bottom that allows the female to go through, but not the male. So when the male wants to follow the female, he cannot do it. And in this way, the female can control the sexual interaction. In the other setting, the animals mate without the barrier and the male is the one that controls the sexual interaction because the female basically cannot escape. And there are important physiological and behavioral consequences of mating under both conditions. Base mating, for example, female, as I already explained, control the rate of sexual stimulation. The in, 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 interval between intermissions is usually longer. Fewer intermissions are required in this case for the female to uh, induce uh, what we call a, a place preference condition, which is something in which we evaluate the reward state induced by sexual behavior. So when the females mate in this condition, they actually develop a positive affective reward state. And it's also the case that in these conditions, females have a higher uh, number of pups when they get pregnant and they get pregnant much easier than in these conditions. So they're basically behavioral and physiological consequence regardless if the females control the the rate of sexual stimulation or the, they don't control the rate of sexual stimulation. And one of the things important is that this is reward state as well as the reward state induced by we're running is mediated by opioids. So I'm not going to go into detail in that, but you can look at some of the publications that we have and you can see that there are enough evidence to show that in both males and females, sexual behavior induces a reward state which is mediated by opioids as well as the reward state that is induced by running wheel, which is also mediated by opioids. So how the circuits have been identified in the pipes in the past, there are a lot of techniques that people have been using to try to identify which circuits control motivated behavior. Some of them are lesion studies, stimulation study, people have used so hormone implants in different brain regions, intracerebral injections, uh, two of neurotransmitters or hormones to see how they these brain regions control different behaviors, neural traces, of course, expression of early genes, and a lot of behavioral tests people have been used to identify how these, how different neural circuits control the different 
behaviors. Just to give you an example, this is what happens when people do lesions in a particular brain area, which is the middle preoptic area, which is very important in the control of male sexual behavior. And lesions of this brain region eliminate sexual behavior permanently in different species. As you can see, basically in all the species that, he, that have been studied, it has been shown that lesions of this brain region basically eliminate sexual behavior if the lesions are sufficiently large. And this is all the species from chicken, frog, mouse, hamster, ferret, goat, cat, and um, dogs and rhesus monkeys. And the behavior, the, the, the behavioral outcome of those leashes is always the same. So this is just a cartoon with some of the circuits that have been described in sexual behavior. Usually these are the important aspects that are related. It's the olfactory bulbs. This is where we are most rodents and uh, the, uh, perceive the chemosensorial, chemosensorial relevant olfactory cues that will induce sexual behavior in both males and females. And then the information from there will go to the medial preoptic area, also to the amygdala, to different parts of the hypothalamus as the vent ventromedial hypothalamus. And this is a part of the circuit that starts behavior and other, other parts that in theory are involved more in the reward aspects of behavior, which are associated mostly with the ventral to area, the nucleus accumbens, and the hippocampus. And there is this uh, study by O'Connell and Huffman, which have identified two circuits of a large decision, what they call the social decision network, which appears to be uh, in different vertebrae lineage. They have identified these circuits, at least in mammal, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and teleos fish. This social decision network, it's composed basically of two networks. One is the social behavior network, which uh, some areas are involved in this social behavior network is, are the amygdala, the ventromedial hypothalamus, the medial preoptic area, and the bed nucleus of the steel terminalis. And the other important uh, network that modifies behavior or regulates different behaviors is the mesolimbic reward system. And some of the areas involved are the nucleus accumbens, the ventral segmental area, also parts of the amygdala and the hippocampus. So some of the things that are common between mating and running wheel, as I was telling you, is that they are both induce a positive, a positive effect state in male and females. Both induce this effect is mediated by opioids and also both of these behaviors induce neurogenesis. I don't know if the neurogenesis induced, for example, by mating or by running wheel is somehow affected or mediated by Pax3. No, as the, as the talk we just heard, that will be interesting, but we haven't actually looked into that, and I'm not sure if it's also mediated by them. But these are common things that have uh, both mating and running wheel behavior. And this is just uh, some of our publications that we had uh, over the last couple of years showing uh, how sexual behavior induces new cells and new neurons in different parts of the subventricular zone the rostral migratory stream, and how they eventually reach either the accessory olfactory bulb or the, main, or the main olfactory bulb. So it's clear that different types of sexual behavior in both males and females can induce the formation of new cells and new neurons. Either uh, two days after the sexual behavior is displayed, we will see a lot of cells in the subventricular zone and the rostral migratory stream. And 15 days later, the cells and the neurons will reach the sexual olfactory bulb and the main olfactory bulb, and some of them will, mean, will remain even 45 days after mating. So these behavioral changes that we see in neurogenesis are permanent. So we decided to try to use now these, I was telling you, this magnetic resonance imaging because it has several advantages over other techniques that I just told you about. One is that we can test the subject several times which is different, for example, to, to the CFO studies or some of the lesion studies in which you see the manipulation just once and maybe it's difficult to get them. Here, the animals actually can be tested several times. We can evaluate longitudinal changes in the same subject. We can see changes in white and gray matter, matter sorry, and functional, and we can evaluate functional and anatomical connectivity either through sagittal planes, coronal planes, or axial planes that we can actually see in the same subject and we can get, we can obtain a lot of information about it. The thing, the thing, the, the, 
technique that we have been using, because there are several techniques, is the, what we what it's called manganese enhanced magnetic resonant imaging. And basically, what we use instead is 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 in this case is manganese. Manganese is a ferromagnetic ion, which is has properties that are analog to calcium and it can enter excited cells and also it can go to transfer through axon and synapses and then we can have high contrast we can look at neuronal ne 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 neuronal tracts sorry about that and activation we can also look at activation of brain circuits in response to a stimulus so this is what we have seen in some of our studies after the, the, uh, the after some of the animals actually mate and we can see that after mating this is just a figure to show you how the olfactory bulbs for example here are highly intensified in their in their uh, response after the animals mate so one of the things that we wanted to evaluate is first and, and this is also another study by Eschenko that has shown that after running wheel you can evaluate some, some changes basically with the uh, administration of manganese. But one of the things that have been there out in the literature is that the manganese can also induce uh, non-specific effects that can affect behavior or even imaging. So the first thing that we wanted to do is to see if manganese could have some unspecific effects that could affect either behavior or that could, could have uh, affected also the acquisition of brain images. So the studies that I'm gonna to talk to you about in the next 10 minutes that have been done basically by uh, Alejandro Aguilar, Lorena Gaitan, and Maria Felisa Barrera. Uh, um, Alejandro is doing his PhD, uh, Lorena is a postdoc at the lab, and Maria Felisa is uh, doing his master's thesis here in the lab. So basically, this is more or less the design we have been using. When we use females as subjects, we have uh, the, all of all our subjects are sexually naive, either male or females. The females are usually overectomized and then given estradiol, benzoate, and progesterone to induce receptivity. And in that way, we can control always that the females are receptive and will display sexual behavior. And we have used different behavioral tasks. We, all, we can use the rotor rod to see if there are effects of motor coordination. We look at open field test to see also how if, if, if motor behavior is affected. Of course, we use the basic running wheel in which the animals can freely use the running wheel. We'll look at mating either on pacing conditions and when the female can control the rate of sexual stimulation. And we are also looking at new different things that we're looking. We are giving the, fem the animals the opportunity to have either access to the running wheel at the same time or to mate. So of course they cannot do it exactly at the same time, but they can choose to do it uh, two different motivated behaviors, either use the running wheel or mate. So the first thing we wanted to do as I as was telling you, assess pos possible behavioral alterations induced by repeated manganese chloride administration. We, uh, Alejandro did that in female rats. So basically we tested the animals for 10 weeks in each week, animals were tested for sexual behavior. Volu uh, immediately after sexual behavior, they were tested for voluntary activity. This is the running wheel or the rotor rod test. And on weeks one, five, and 10, they were given a uh, dose of manganese chloride to see if there were any behavioral effects because we were in an another experiment, we, want we wanted to test the uh, magnetic resonance imaging after the manganese administration, and we will also do it in the same one, five, and 10 weeks. So we use two doses according to the literature, eight milligrams per kilogram and 16 milligrams per kilogram. And when we analyze sexual behavior, you can have a lot of parameters like the mounts, intromission, and ejaculations. Or in the case of the females, you can evaluate lower dosis quotient or the mean lower dosis intensity, as well as the return and ex X percentage of exits after they receive amount of transmission from the male. And basically we didn't have found any uh, sexual behavior difference on weeks one, five and 10 when manganese was administered. We also look into possible effects on uh, running wheel. And as you can see, well, this is uh, uh, both of them. This is uh, the, the distance travel in meters. And as you can see, uh, there were some effects, but not in the uh, 
not in the, I mean, the animals did not stop running. Contrary to what, what we expected compared to the control group, which is are here in the dark circles, the animals treated with manganese even probably run a little more on weeks eight and nine compared to the control group. So it wasn't an effect in which the animals would stop running. And we didn't find any effects in the rotorot. As you can see here, more or less all the animals became more or less similarly along all the weeks when tested in the rotorot test. So once we found that the manganese administration will not produce any behavioral alterations in doses of 18 or 16 milligrams per kilogram, the next thing we wanted to do is to evaluate what was the best image, what was the best image content we could have uh, uh, obtained with both doses of manganese. So for that, we, Alejandro, run a different set of animals. In this case, it was the same sequence of tests along the test week, in this case, they only, the animals only receive sexual behavior tests. And after the sexual behavior test, they were brought to the magnetic resonance facility and we scan the animals. Before that, we give them administration of manganese 24 hours before the actual behavioral test. And we have uh, two control groups of, and one experimental group that was injected with eight milligrams per kilogram and another group that was injected with 16 milligrams per kilogram. So this is some of the uh, uh, images that we can obtain. We can see different parts of the brain. As you can see here, this is the medial preoptic area, which we see an activation after mating, also at the ventromedial hypothalamus, you know, the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens. So basically you can, you obtain a lot of information that you can look at different brain areas just for, with one scan. Let me see the next one. So this is just uh, why, how we see the signal intensity after being normalized against the uh, template control or uh, control template that we can sue and this uh, that we can use and this is the effects on the BNST. You can see that in week ten we have a higher intensity compared to other to other to the previous sessions and to the other groups and this is the group which had uh, the uh, in this case the pace mating. We also see effects on the olfactory bulb and the medial preoptic area. And also we saw some effects of that uh, uh, with uh, the BMH with the dose of 16 milligrams per kilogram. So based on this, we decided to then to use for the rest of our experiments, the dose of 16 milligrams per kilogram that will give us a good signal without affecting other behaviors in, in, in an, an a specific manner. I'm just waiting for the next slide to come up. And this is what we see when we divide, the, the, remember when we were talking about the reward circuit or the sexual behavior, re, uh, the, the, sexual behavior the, the sexual behavior circuit, basically we also see a difference. As you can see here, we have the control groups that did not mate. And you can see here that in week five, apparently, what we see first is a acti higher activation of the sexual circuit. And in week 10, we can see the same sexual circuit that has a higher activation, but then the reward circuit is also activated compared to the other groups. So it appears that first you need to activate the sexual circuit before the reward circuit comes into place to kind to, because one of the things that we have looked at is that sexual behavior through the induction of a reward start a state will assure that the behavior will be repeated in the future. And now what Alejandro is doing in the next, ex, in the, in the next experiment, he's looking now at how will be the difference between non-pace mating, as I show you, and pace mating. So this is what Alejandro is doing now in his experiment, but we're gonna have to wait for the results because he's still working on that. The other uh, part that we've been looking at is we also been looking at males. Lorena Gaitanto Caben has been looking at brain structures activated by partner preference and sexual motivation, sexual incentive motivation in males. In the partner preference test, as you can see here, the stimulus animals are, are tethered so they cannot escape from their respective compartment. And the subject can move from one compartment to the other and have sexual interaction or social social interactions with a female or with a male. And in this case, there is a, a physical interaction between the subjects and the stimulus. 
In the other test, which is the sexual incentive motivation test, we also have, in this case, as an, a male that uh, is exposed to either a receptive female or a sexually experienced male. And in this case, the subject stays closer to either one of the stimulus, but there is no physical contact. The subject can actually see, hear, and smell the other incentives, but there's no physical contact in that. And the, basically the experiments are the same. We test them for 10 weeks to see changes along the, the, the time. And the animals are given also a running wheel test. They're tested in the rota rod. And after that, they're tested for sexual behavior. In the same doses, since we already shown that the dose of 60 milligrams per kilogram does not have serial behavioral effects in females, we use the same dose and this is males. We're still evaluating and apparently there is a small effect in case of the males compared to the females in the effects of manganese, but nothing that will necessarily affect uh, the, 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 the behavior. So this is what we saw with the sexual incentive motivation female as expected when the animals are tested in weeks one, five and 10 for the sexual incentive motivation. The animals show in this case, or males show a clear preference for the female incentive. And when they, for, because they mate every week and they also spend in this case, a higher time with the female than with the male. So our males, regardless of the manganese treatment, they behave as the controlled mates and they show a clear preference for the females in both tests. And this is what happened when we look at manganese intensity after either one of these tests on weeks five, you know, weeks one, five, and 10. And we can see here, for example, with the sexual incentive motivation test, the ventromedial hypothalamus, is, the signal of the ventromedial hypothalamus is increased at week 10. And in the medial preoptic area, we see an increase in week five and in week 10. And, uh, oh, sorry, I was trying to, and here in the partner preference test, we also see an increase for example, in other areas that are not activated by sexual incentive motivation. In this case, the nucleus accumbens is activated, which we don't see, for example, with the sexual incentive motivation test. We also see an increase in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis in comparison to what happens with the sexual incentive motivation test. So Lorena is still analyzing those data. And we're going to see what happens in the when we look at the different uh, networks to see if there's a difference there. And then we thought we had a really uh, interesting and original idea of, as I was telling you, to test the males or the females and having the opportunity to do those the two behaviors at the same time. So here you see an animal doing the running wheel. In this case, it's a female that is placed with a male. The male is here uh, waiting for the female, and the female actually starts doing the running wheel. And after a while, as you can see here, the female steps down, goes with a male, receives a mount in this case, and then she goes back to the running wheel. So in this case, we thought it was really an original idea that we can test how these two different uh, behaviors are activated when two different motivated behaviors at the same time have the animal the opportunity to do it. But then we look, let me go, oops, I know I want to go to the next, ah. So it was so original that we found a paper that it was doing similar things in 1927. Of course, they didn't use magnetic resonance imaging because it wasn't available at the time. But in that paper by Richard, they look at difference in running wheel behavior depending on the estro cycle, and they also allow the females to mate. So what we thought was original wasn't original at all. It was done 19, in 1927. But of course, they didn't use, as I was telling you, um, magnetic resonance, but they show that running activity increases also with sex behavior when the animals are in heat, what we call now estrus behavior. Also here, the message is for the students, look, you know, don't look only for what is published in PubMed, go to the original sources and go back, but go back as far as you can, because when you think you have something really new, it turns out that it was done many years ago. So just be aware that it's a possibility. So Maria, Lisa, Maria Felisa, she's looking into that experiment. We have several groups. We have a control group that stays in the cage. We have a group of females that does open field behavior only. We have a group that looks uh, that it's, it's allowed only to do to run the wheel. We have a group that 
is only allowed to do pacing. And we have a group that both does both has the opportunity to do both things at the same time. That is do pacing and wheel running. And that's what happens, you know, during during a week. Most of the animals are the animals, this group is exposed to the wheel every day of the week. And the other group that does voluntary wheel running and pacing will do pacing only one day of the week and the rest will be doing voluntary wheel running. Compared we to have uh, five minutes left. Almost, almost done. And this is also done for 10 weeks from week walk until week 10 to, su to, be su to see some of the behavioral changes. And this is basically what we do. We take the animals to the um, resonator, which is a bioscan broker of seven Tesla. And this is where we obtain most of uh, all, all our images. And this is just preliminary results because um, Maria Felisa has only four animals per group, but I thought it was important to share with you that at least we can see that females that can do the wheel running and pacing apparently are more activated than the other groups that do wheel running and the groups that only do open field behavior. And this is what we're looking also at different brain areas to see how the signal intensity is changing and look at, you can look basically uh, a lot of uh, brain structures. So our conclusion is that administration of 60 milligrams per kilogram of manganese do not induce behavioral alterations that could interfere with interpretation of MRI data. The sexual behavior circuit, at least in females, is activated before the reward circuit in, in females that pace the sexual interaction. And then we need to see what happens in females that do not pace. And we're looking at, Lorena is looking in more detail to see what happens in males. And Lorena also showed that in males, partner preference and sexual insecting motivation activate different structures. Partner preference activates the nucleus accumbens and the BNST, and sexual insecting motivation activates the medial preoptic area and the amygdala. And of the good thing is we also need to always need have future studies. We will determine, as I told you, difference in pace and non-pace mating behavior, and if the same circuits activate both type of behaviors. Now, we always want to have uh, answers for everything. We wish that, but you have to be careful with what you wish, you know, because this is what happened when you wish something that you cannot actually do. And I just want to thank all the members of the lab. And we also have funding from the GAPA and CONACY. And that'd be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paredes. I have um, a couple of questions um, that maybe we can answer quickly. The first one is from Monica, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lopez Hidalgo, that says, what would be the physiological relevance of inducing neurogenesis after these motivated behaviors? And she notes that this, especially because it doesn't seem to be a lot of neurons um, in, the, in the figures that you showed. Yes, uh, that, that's probably the, the, the big question in the, within the neurogenesis because most of behaviors that induce neurogenesis do not induce a lot of neuro neurons. And the big question is, what are the new neurons doing? You know, we, we actually are interested in some time, uh, some time pursuing what are the, we know that the new neurons get into the olfactory bulb and integrate and they show false expression. Rebecca Corona and the ones that show that they can show the, that these new neurons actually induce false expression. But the question, not only with sexual behavior, but with all the behaviors that induce neurogenesis, is what are the neurons doing? I think that 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 that's one of the things that is researchers are still pursuing to try to find out what are those neurons doing. And another one, another which is re related to that one by uh, Lloyd Orton, it says very interesting. Why is neurogenesis predominantly found along the rostral migratory stream, and in the olfactory bulb? We have a polysensory brain. So is there something special about the olfactory system in this regard? In the case of the olfactory, oh, yeah, we, we look, we, the, I didn't mention that, but we also see, and there are other groups that have shown that sexual behavior induces neurogenesis also in the hippocampus. But in the olfactory bulb, it's also probably because a lot of, uh, or it's a system that is very important for the production. It's a system that processes the chemosensory olfactory relevant cues, otherwise known as, as pheromones. And one system that also comes into play there is uh, what it's called um, the Bruce effect, where females actually remember the uh, smell or the urine or the male that they got pregnant from. So this can be probably associated with uh, what happens during reproduction and the learning that goes along with the different aspects of reproduction. 
But we have looked into other places of the brain, for example, and we don't see a lot of neurogenesis, for example, in other brain areas associated with uh, reproduction as the medial preoptic area or the amygdala. And it's also the case that the olfactory bulb, this system that goes from the subventricular zone, rostral migratory steam and olfactory bulbs, has shown a lot of neurogenesis. Even without sexual behavior, there is a high uh, rate of neurogenesis alone in that system. Thank you very much. So I don't see any more questions and it's 9.59. So I think uh, this was, has been a successful series of three binational seminars. And I hope that we continue to, to have them and to share other types of um, research that is being done at the University of M Metropolitan University of Manchester and the NS. Um, so this would be the last transmission from this year, uh, from this binational series. I don't know if Dr. Perez wants to say anything else. It's 10 o'clock. Sí, just uh, very quickly, but just uh, we, like Dr. Jordano was saying, I hope with Aray that we can continue with this, uh, with this, with these kind of seminars and then expand them to other uh, interesting also with uh, Manchester University and NS that I think we had very a lot of things in common and also want to thank to Anne Elena for all the help in putting this together and I hope this is a series of successful and coming uh, seminars and just uh, happy holidays to everyone. I don't know if Araida wants to say something also. I wanted to thank all the attendants, of course, all the colleagues who gave their time to share the research, both in the UK and in Mexico. I think this is a, a very fruitful collaboration that is just starting. There are lots of common ground to work together among researchers and students, of course. So yes, we're looking forward to having a, a new series on a different topic uh, in 2021, a couple of series actually, not only for the life science and, and biomedical sciences, but also for the rest of courses in NS. Uh, thank you very much for, for this collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Raida. Uh, you, I would like to say something just very briefly. Um, a, a very special thank you to Araida Hidalgo and to Dr. Raul Paredes for their excellent disposition. I'm sure that you realize what the importance of international experience is. Um, thank you very much to all the participants, all the speakers, um, Dr. Magda Giordano, Dr. Chu Yu Wang, and everybody else who took part in this. Um, we are really looking forward to, to hearing your comments later, and hopefully you will have new ideas and things that you may be willing to share and to have the, this type of exchange. Um, uh, even though we are having others in other subjects, let us not lose the track of, of neuroscience for um, being the inaugural one. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Thank Happy you. holidays. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.